You're listening to a message from Gateway Church Geelong. We hope it blesses you. For more information about Gateway, visit gc.org.au. Well, it's so good to be with you here this morning and to have the privilege of sharing the Word of God with you this morning. And, you know, over the last um, cu- last week, Pastor Lee spoke about preparation and activation and how we as a church, we're preparing and learning the ways of Jesus so we can activate the ways of Jesus in our lives, in our families, in our communities. And, you know, one of the things that Jesus spoke about with his disciples a lot was the subject of faith. And I'd love to speak today about persistent, powerful faith. But, you know, my heart, my prayer today is that it wouldn't just be information that you receive, but you receive fresh revelation, greater revelation about the power of faith, the power of your declaration of faith. But also that's in that activation, in that preparation of hearing the word that you also activated, that you go into your week, into your world, into your family and declare that faith in your community, speak out that faith and walk that faith and activate it in your family. So let's pray this morning. Lord God, I just thank you that you are so committed to growing us and making us more like you. And I pray this morning as I speak that, Lord, you would speak to each of our hearts, that you would teach us how to prepare and grow our faith, but then to activate it in whatever area you are calling us to. In your name, amen. So when Jesus spoke about faith as disciples, he didn't talk about it as this sort of, you know, hopeful, maybe, perhaps kind of faith. He spoke about it as a powerful faith, a faith that could move mountains. We see this in Mark 11, 22 to 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, have faith in God. I tell you the truth. You can say to the mountain, may you be lifted up and thrown into the sea and it will happen. But you must really believe it will happen and have no doubt in your heart. I tell you, you can pray for anything. And if you believe that you've received it, it will be yours. What a powerful scripture that you can say to the mountain to move. You can believe for anything and it will be yours. You know, Jesus says something similar where in Matthew 17, 20, where he says, faith as small as a mustard seed can move mountains. Now, is anyone here a fan of mountains? Walking mountains, hiking mountains, looking at mountains. Yep. I actually don't mind a good like mountain hike or mountain walk, Um, but I'd love to survey the room and see how many people prefer walking uphill compared to downhill. Uphill? Yeah, feel of all you can relate. Downhill's not good for the knees, is it? It's terrible for the knees. I can relate to that. How many people prefer downhill, walking downhill? Yep, few people down. How many people prefer not to walk at all? (laughs) Fair, fair. Mason, I see that hand. (laughs) Tim, I see that hand. But you know, the funny thing is, we definitely have our preferences. And Pastor Naomi and I, a few years back, we were in Indonesia and we walked up Mount Batur. And you know, I definitely prefer the downhill, but she was like a mountain go down, down, downhill, pretty much skipping downhill, weren't you? And I was like, every step, my knees are sore, my knees are sore, my knees are sore. But you know, regardless of what, whether we prefer mountains uphill or downhill, the reality is that mountains are a towering structure. They can seem like really big things. And it's interesting that Jesus says faith that can move mountains because mountains can seem immovable, whether you're going up them or going down them. They can seem like really big things in our life. But Jesus says with faith you can move mountains, things that seem immovable in your life, circumstances that seem to tower over you and take hold of you and things that seem impossibly difficult to climb. Faith that can move mountains. But what is faith? See, sometimes faith can seem something very abstract or intangible. This hopeful, fingers crossed, I'm going to have a lot of faith, I'm going to hold really tightly and something will happen. But can I encourage you this morning, my friends, that biblical faith is different. See, the word faith in the Greek, it can be translated to mean an assurance, a firm belief conviction in things related to God, a belief predominantly built around trust. The word, this word for faith is used in Hebrews 11.1. Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. That faith is a confidence that we know that God will do what he can. An assurance, being so convinced that he has got you, that you can rely on him on your circumstance, that the things that are immovable, hey, they may still be immovable, they may still seem like a mountain, but you are assured that God will work it out. See, God has promised to lead us and guide us. That's an amazing promise that we can have. Psalm 32.8 says this, The Lord says, I will guide you along the best pathway for your life. I will advise you and watch over you. 
What an amazing promise that God will guide us along the best, best pathway. He's the one who created the universe. He's the one who created us. I think it would make sense that he would know what's best for us and that he can guide us along the best path of our life. So can I encourage you that we can choose to trust him, to lean on him with faith. But you know, faith is not based on how hard we believe. It's not this like, I clench everything and hope really hard and it will come to pass. Faith is given. We can ask God to give us faith. See, in 2 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, Simon Peter writing to the church, this is Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ have received a faith. That through, our, through believing in Jesus Christ, through the righteousness we have in Jesus, we have received a faith as precious as this. Faith is given. We can ask God to help us grow our faith. But just because it's given doesn't make it passive. Faith needs to be activated in our lives. But what does activating faith look like? Well, today let's look at the account of the faith of a Canaanite woman, a woman who comes to Jesus, a mother who comes needing breakthrough for our daughter, we're reading from Matthew 15, verses 21 to 28. If you've got your Bible with you, I'd encourage you to follow along. If you've got your Bible app on your phone, to follow along as we go through this passage. Matthew 15, starting at verse 21. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering te terribly. We see this woman, she comes to Jesus. She has a need. She needs a breakthrough for her daughter. You know, for us today, what situation might you need breakthrough in? Is it in your work, in your study, in your business? Could it be with the family, med family ma member? Could it be restoration of a relationship? Could it be the salvation of a family member, someone coming back to knowing Jesus? Perhaps it's healing for a health issue. Perhaps you're needing breakthrough in a bad habit or a practice that you're wanting to overcome that you can't break through on your own strength. Can I encourage you, just like the Canaanite woman did, come to Jesus with your need. Come to Jesus in prayer with your need. We see the Canaanite woman does this, but we keep reading in verse 23. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away for she keeps crying out after us. He, Jesus answered, I was only sent to the lost sheep of Israel. So the Canaanite woman comes to Jesus, but initially he doesn't answer. In fact, it says he did not answer a word. He doesn't even say a word. And you know, for us today, perhaps sometimes it can feel like this. We are asking God for something in prayer. We're asking God something and we can feel like, I'm not getting the answer. I'm not hearing anything. Let me encourage you with this. God hears you when you pray. You can be assured that God hears you when you pray. 1 John 5, 14 to 15 says this, this is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we ask of him. Be confident that God not only hears you, my friend, as you pray, but he answers your prayer. It may not always be in the way we think, the timing we think or the way we think, but he will answer. And this is what we see he does in the life of the Canaanite woman. See, as we read back in verse 23, 24, the disciples are like, she's making a lot of commotion. Send her away. She keeps crying out after us. And then Jesus responds, I was only sent for the lost sheep of Israel. To give you some context to understand this, for the most part, Jesus at that, part, at that time was ministering to the Israelites. So it was common belief that the Messiah, the promised Savior, was only for the Jews. See, this was the religious norm that Jesus talks about. But what we know of Jesus is that he came to break and push past religious norms, past society barriers. You know, we see that in the account of Zacchaeus, where a, a disliked tax collector, Jesus says, I'm going to your house. And the Samaritan woman at the well, he said, you know what? Samaritans are not meant to associate with, each, with us, but I'm going to pursue after you. Jesus was in the business of pushing past cultural norms and barriers. Even though he said that to her, he wasn't bound by it. Because Jesus came for the redemption and the salvation of all humanity. Romans 1.16 says this, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, Paul writes, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. First the Jew, then the Gentile. See, Paul had the benefit of hindsight here. 
as do we today. That hindsight, that we know that Jesus came to save the whole world. But you know, it's interesting here, this woman, this woman didn't have this. The Canaanite woman didn't have the hindsight. She only knew what she knew. Yet she comes to faith in Jesus. Yet she comes in faith to say, Jesus, have mercy on me. Help my daughter. Spoiler alert, Jesus was moved by her faith. Jesus commends her for her faith. If you're following on your Bible, you can see the later verses that she says, you have great faith. Mega faith is the original word that it's translated to. You know, the Canaanite woman's faith that day broke past societal barriers. Her faith broke past cultural norms. She saw a breakthrough beyond what was meant to naturally happen in that day. But I love her declaration. She says, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. She calls Jesus Lord, a term that recognizes authority. But son of David is a term used for the, this promised saver, the Messiah King. The, one, the revelation she had was that before her time was a powerful one that she saw, Jesus, I need you as my Lord and Savior. She acknowledged him as her Lord and Savior. You know, for us today, the first step of activating faith is recognizing your need for Jesus in your life. My friend, God in his great love, as we heard about in communion, sent Jesus to earth for a purpose, the redemption and salvation of all humanity. 1 John chapter 4, verse 9 to 10 says this, this is how God showed his love for us. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. This is the kind of love we are talking about. Not that we once upon a time loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to clear away our sins and the damage they've done to our relationship with God. My friends, what a great encouragement that God sent Jesus to live on the earth. He lived a perfect life that qualified him to go to the cross for the, our sin, the wrongdoing that we do. This is the kind of love that he has for us. Jesus' death, burial and resurrection made a way for you and I to be forgiven, to be restored to right relationship with God and to walk with him. And this is what we can declare. This is the, this is the good news of Jesus. This is the gospel. And if you've not received this gift of salvation, if you've not made a decision to acknowledge your need for Jesus, I would love to give you the opportunity and this message to do so. See, because this is what the Canaanite woman did. She acknowledged her need for Jesus. But even though Jesus said, you know, I'm only sent for the lost sheep of Israel, she was not deterred. She persisted in pursuing him. In Matthew 15, 25, the woman came and knelt before him and said, Lord, help me, she said. She kept persisting. She asked again. My friends, for you and I today, perhaps we may not get the answer to our prayer straight away. Can I encourage you to keep persisting? Keep persisting in your prayer. Keep persisting in your declaration. Keep declaring in faith that God will come through for you. Jesus, when he told his disciples a parable about the persistent widow that saw a breakthrough because of her persistence, he said this, one day Jesus told his disciples a story to show that they should always pray and never give up. You know, it can, take, it can be tricky sometimes when we're not seeing the answer. And is anyone here naturally a problem solver? You want to try and find a solution to problems? Yep, I see a few hands there. And, you know, can I encourage you that sometimes when we don't see the answer to prayer straight away, it can be easier, it can be the tendency to want to, do you know what, how can I work this out myself? How can I solve this in my own strength? Can I crunch the numbers? Can I work this out in my own ability? And you know what, here my heart here, I think there's, there's great power in doing your due diligence, doing your research, doing your, you know, whatever you need to do in the natural to see things come to pass. But can I encourage you, can we be a people who persist in seeking God's will, who persist in seeking his way, to persist in our prayer and our declaration of faith that at the first, at the first point where we don't see the outcome, do we straight away go, hang on, I'm going to try and work this out myself? Or can we pivot and say, do you know what, Lord, I don't see the answer yet, like the woman, the cat woman, but I'm going to keep pursuing after you. I'm going to keep declaring in faith because because I want to see this change in my life. Yes, I can try and work it out myself, but I'm going to keep my eyes fixed on you, the author and perfecter of my faith, so this situation will break through. Can I encourage you? Let's be people who do that. I want to be someone who does that. I know this is something that I had to learn even in the last couple of weeks. See, I submitted a grant or we submitted a grant um, for the community pantry to get some funding. And, you know, I was so full of faith. I was like, do you know what? We're going to get this grant. I don't want to have any doubt in my mind. And, I, you know, you're trying to sort of tell yourself, don't get your hopes up too high because you might be disappointed. Um, but I'm going to be so full of faith to this outcome. Now, the reality is we found out this week that we didn't receive that grant. 
Was I disappointed? Yes, I was disappointed. But you know what? I had to pivot and going rather than being like, right, well, let's move on to the next thing. Let's see what we can do here in my own strength, in our own ability. It's like, Lord, I'm going to trust you for the next one. I'm going to keep persisting and declaring in faith. You know, we haven't seen it this time, but you are a God who answers prayers. So I'm going to be full of faith and keep persisting. Yes, we still do our due diligence. Yes, we still do what we need to do in the natural here. But keep fixing our eyes on you and declaring in faith that you will bring it to pass if that is your will. My friend, can I encourage you? Keep declaring in faith. Keep persisting in coming to Jesus in prayer. Because we see as the Canaanite woman does this, Jesus responds. In Matthew 15, verse 26, he, Jesus, replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Interesting response. It can seem a bit odd that Jesus would say that to this God who loves people, his heart is for all people. But again, let me bring you back to the context of the day. The Messiah was supposedly for Israel. So Jesus uses this this illustration to say, you know, the children's bread and the dogs to describe the culture of the time. But remembering he worked beyond cultural boundaries or stigmas. However, I love this woman's response of faith, this mother's response of faith for the daughter's breakthrough. In verse 27, she says this, yes, it is, Lord, she said, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. See, Jesus gives her an illustration, but she brings it back with an illustration of her own. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Now, in my household, in our household, when something falls to the ground, when crumbs fall to the ground, This is what we use to clean it up, a vacuum. But you know, our really good friends, Ozzy and Tim, when crumbs fall to the ground, this is what they have to clean up the ground. Can anyone relate? If you've got a dog at home, if you've ever had a dog, they're very quick and willing as soon as anything drops the ground to be like scurry over and you don't even see it. I remember going to their house and literally River dropped a yo-yo for like two seconds and that yo-yo was gone in forest belly, not even a crumb, a whole yo-yo. They will take anything from the table. But you know, this woman illustrates her heart in that illustration. That you know, she says, true Jesus, I know you're sent for Israel, but I will take a crumb. A crumb is all I need. The Canaanite woman recognizes Jesus' power in her life. She says, you know what? I know I'm asking for something that's beyond what should happen the natural, but I know you are powerful. Can I just take a crumb that can bring hailing to my daughter? You know, this reminds me of the centurion who was also a non-Israelite who said, you know what, you don't need to come to my house. I'm not worthy to have you come to my house, but just say the word. Just say the word. One word from you can bring healing to my life. What to my servant? One word from you, just a crumb can bring healing. You know, for us today, what does this mean, friends? For you and I, as we activate faith, recognize Jesus' power and authority in your life. Recognize the power and authority you have access to. Like the woman said, just a crumb. Just a little speck of your power can bring healing into my life and declare Jesus' power and authority in your life. Let me encourage you with this scripture, Ephesians 1 verses 19 to 20. I also pray, this is Paul prayer, Paul's prayer. I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us, for you and I who believe in Him. This is the same mighty power that raised Jesus from the dead and seated Him in the place of honour at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Friends, if you have believed and declared Jesus as your Lord and Saviour, you have access to this great power. Not just any power, incredible great power. The same mighty power that raised Jesus from the dead. And can I encourage you in activating faith, verbalise that over yourself. Speak it out over yourself. Write it down if you need to. Put it on a post-it note. Put this scripture as, a home scre- as the home screen on your phone. Recognize the authority you have. The same mighty power that raised Jesus from the dead is available to you. Talk about it with your family, in your connect group, with other believers. Keep declaring Jesus' power in your life. Keep activating faith. Recognizing and declaring the power and authority that's available to you. And can I encourage you, this is not an overnight or a one-off thing that it's a lifelong journey that we do of activating faith. And we can ask God to help us. Again, faith is given. We can ask God to help us, to trust Him and believe Him, that He will help us. In Mark 9, 17 to 29, a father comes to Jesus for his son heal- his son healing, his son's healing. And Jesus says to him, everything is possible for one who believes. The man replies, 
I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. That we can come to Jesus and say, I'm doubting this. I'm not so sure about this, but help me to have the faith to see this come to pass. And you know, we see as the Canaanite woman does this, as she activates faith in verse 28. Then Jesus said to her, woman, you have great faith. Like I said, the word for great is mega. You have mega faith. You have mega faith for this breakthrough. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that moment. You know, as I said, her persistent faith caused a miracle to happen beyond what was a natural progression for that time. Her persistent faith saw Jesus move powerfully in her life, in her daughter's life. For you and I today, let me encourage you, Jesus can and will move powerfully in your life. Keep declaring and believing in faith. Be encouraged, Jesus can and will move powerfully in and through you. But you know what? Don't just take my word for it. I've actually invited two amazing women to share a testimony today of how God has, they've seen God work through their lives as they activated faith. And you know, I've got Fiona and Margaret to share a testimony today. So I'll invite Margaret to come up and share how she activated faith and saw a breakthrough in a situation in her life. Morning, everyone. A few months ago, I became aware that one of my work colleagues seemed to be having a particularly tough time with something. And after speaking with her, she told me that she was going through some serious personal problems. After a couple of further conversations with her over the next few weeks, things didn't seem to have come to any resolution for her, but she was still holding on to hope that they would find a way through. During our last conversation, I told her that since she and I had first spoken, I had begun praying for her, asking God to reconcile her situation and to show them a way forward. I didn't say any more as she's not a Christian, nor do I think particularly religious, although she seemed quite okay with me praying for them. It was some three weeks or so after that, during a quiet time at work, when no one was around, she came up to me to tell me that after some in-depth, honest conversations, they had started their journey of reconciliation and things were looking much brighter and better. In fact, she said that their relationship had grown from this and was even better than when they first met, that their joy had been restored tenfold. I was particularly overjoyed for her to hear this and I said to her that this is what God does. When he does the restoring, it's always so much more than we can ever envision or imagine. She finished by thanking me for praying for them. For someone who's not a Christian or religious, I was thankful that she had sought me out and acknowledged this to me. It filled my heart with joy and my own faith grew in that moment. I'm often reminded of the parable that Jesus tells in Matthew 17:20. Truly, I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. This scripture teaches us that God's word, though small in appearance, has incredible transformative power. Great things can come from humble beginnings and as believers, we should plant God's word in our hearts every day. God answered my prayer for a work colleague. This has then had an impact on my own faith. It also speaks to the truth that God's love is for everyone, believer or not. Be encouraged that when you start to pray, it's not about how big your faith is, but rather about your heart and belief that God is a God of transformation. That regardless of how little faith you feel you have, God can do great things with even faith the size of a mustard seed. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Fiona, and um, Trent and I have two beautiful children, Mason and Thea. And this is Randy asked me to share my testimony about our journey to get pregnant with Mason and we struggled to get pregnant with him for 18 months and I'd always had this really deep seated longing for children um, ever since we got married and so when the time had come we thought yep okay the time is right we started trying and nothing was happening and 
I was absolutely heartbroken. I had all my married friends around me were getting pregnant and they were having their babies and they were soon surrounded by little crying babies around me. And I was genuinely tremendously happy for them all. But I would come home from church some days and I would be overcome with the grief for what I didn't have. So being a nurse, I took a medical approach and I tried to assess every little thing that was going on and trying to fix this and I obsessed with my problem. Um, One day I was about to join these pregnancy chat forums. I had downloaded an app where I was putting it on my data and I was about to join these pregnancy chat forums and I heard a voice say to me, stop, you're going too far. And I knew instantly that I couldn't continue down that path down that rabbit hole of negativity. So instantly I deleted the app and I stopped obsessing over every little thing. And I remember praying to God and saying, I don't know why I'm going through this, but there's obviously a lesson I have to learn in this, so I'm going to shut up and learn it. We have very real conversations. And I knew that when the time was right that God would make this happen. So over the following months, I still used wisdom and I, and I did all the right things in the natural. But I stayed away from anything that was speaking against my faith and I stayed away from the negativity. Instead, I kept coming back to God in prayer, like that pivot that Renu said, is that every time something tried to knock my faith, I just kept coming back to God. So I saw my obstetrician in the September. This has been about four months since I said that prayer to God and he said to me look we have three options one we can do this surgery two I actually don't remember what number two was because the third thing he said which blew my socks off was three usually doctors entertain patients while God does the healing I didn't even know my obstetrician was a Christian So a couple of months go by and I started feeling really poorly and I was exhausted. I was a night owl, but I came home from work and as soon as dinner was done, I was hitting the pillow. And it occurred to me, oh, do a test. Now, I was so used to negative tests. I had done 18 months worth of negative tests and when it came up positive, I was absolutely gobsmacked. And so I had to do a second one. And then I go like walking around trying to find Trent in the house with these two tests going like this. And he's like, what, what? I said, we're pregnant, we're pregnant. And I still didn't believe it until I went and got a blood test and got that back. Now I have may have been so excited that the next day at work, I ran down the hallway to my colleagues and said, and I'm pregnant. But the big thing is, is a couple of months after, We had a testimony night at church and unbeknownst to me, there was another couple in our church at the time who were struggling with infertility as well. And I shared um, this testimony, as I've shared to you, and the husband of that couple leant over to Pastor Phil and said, if God can do it for them, he can do it for us. And in a couple of months later, they were pregnant. And I was so thankful to God. And in that moment, I thought to myself, If I have to go through this 10 times for somebody to have the faith to believe for God to do this healing in them, I would do it again in a heartbeat. Instantly, like all that pain, that suffering, that grief was just washed away in thankfulness to God that he would use me to bring faith not only to me and my family, but also to another couple. You know, Mason is our miracle. He knows that. I tell him that. I tell him that he is the child that I prayed for for years, that I dreamt of for years. He is the child that I prayed over when he was in my belly and I said to God, he will be a worshipper because I'm so thankful to you for what you've done. He will be a worshipper. And I tell you, that kid is absolute worshipper. But every time I look at Mason, he's my reminder that God saw the desires of my heart and that he answered my prayer. And not only did this open up for Mason, but this miracle that God did for for us in in having Mason, then opened up the pathway for us to have Thea. And 
I look at her and I think that she is the completion of my heart's desires. So what God did 12 years ago still reverberates and strengthens me every time I go through another battle because they come. And every time I'm down, this is my, my rock that I stand on. But if God can do that, what else can he do? That he is such a miracle working God and every little thing, the small things, the giant things, I have seen him work over and over and over. And I really hope that that encourages you all today as much as it encourages me. What amazing testimonies, hey, of what God can do in our lives as we activate faith. And I love, you know, how Margaret had a moment where she activated faith for someone else. But by doing that for someone else, it built her faith as well. And I love how Fiona, by activating faith for her family, saw a breakthrough in her family, but it also encouraged another family. So my friends, let me encourage you today. Keep persisting in your faith. There is such great power in that persistent faith. Keep staying the course. Keep recognizing and declaring Jesus' authority and power in your life. And you know, if you're here this morning, and what I said at the start, the first step of activating faith, acknowledging your need for Jesus in your life. You know, just like the woman did, she came to Jesus and said, Lord, help me. The first step of activating faith is acknowledging, Lord, help me. I need you in my life. Acknowledging your need for Jesus, that, as I said, we can receive this gift of salvation to be forgiven for the wrong things we have done, to be restored to right relationship with God. And this request of Lord, help me, in Romans 10, 13, it says, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, just like she called on the name of the Lord, will be saved. This first step of activating faith is done to, through a prayer, a prayer that declares, Jesus, I need you as Lord. I acknowledge I've done wrong things, but I need you as Lord. And I believe that God raised you from the dead. Roman 10, 9 says this, If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So my friend, if you're watching here, if you're here in this room listening this morning or you're watching online, and you haven't said that prayer, you haven't acknowledged your need for Jesus, or perhaps you've been doing your own thing, you're like, do you know what, I need to make a commitment to say, I need you, Jesus, I want you to lead my life. I'm going to lead the church in a prayer. The church will repeat that prayer after me, and I encourage you, I invite you to join in that prayer. So church, will you repeat after me as we close our eyes and bow our heads? Dear Jesus, I thank you that you went to the cross for me because you love me. I declare you as Lord and I believe in my heart that you died, you were buried and you rose again for my forgiveness and the rest restoration of my relationship with you. I'm sorry for the things I've done wrong. I turn to you and choose to follow you. Amen. We pray that that message was a blessing to you. If you made a decision to follow Jesus, first of all, congratulations. We think that that is incredible. And secondly, if you go to gc.org.au forward slash first steps, our team has put together some resources as well as there's some information there for how you can get in contact with one of our pastors because we'd love to encourage you and connect you into the life of the church.